Thank you. And it looks like I'm your lunch entertainment, so I will try and make this um, exciting enough to keep you up. Um, and I'm going to apologize ahead of time because the agenda said I'm going to be talking about this recreational fishing license. But in actuality, I'm not. I'm going to be telling you a story. Um, because basically half this room isn't from Hawaii. Um, you may not be interested or you may not be familiar with the players in Hawaii, the issues in Hawaii. Um, but what I'm hoping you're going to be interested in is the process and the approach that we took to um, kind of solving a big issue in Hawaii and that is the license, the fishing license. Um, so I, and again, I'm going to apologize ahead, ahead of time because I'm going to be talking about this from multiple perspectives. And the reason why I'm doing that is um, I've been involved with kind of this initiative from when I was with the state, when I was with NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program, and now um, because I'm with Conservation International. But um, as you can imagine, this, this kind of topic has been around Hawaii forever. Uh, anybody know who's in the picture? That's the landlord. <laughs> it's a different kind of fellowship. <laughs> and I hope it'll, it'll make sense in a bit. Okay, so onwards to the story. Once upon a time, Conservation International had a crazy idea. They wanted to know is a recreational marine fishing license feasible for Hawaii? And it had been done before, it had been tried before, and but year after year, all attempts failed. And some people said it was due to legal challenges. Um, whispers from dark corners said it was due to a lack of political will. And I would even dare say that it was due to a lack of government trust. Um, but just in general, most people said, eh, not possible for Hawaii. So Conservation International was interested in learning, is a non-commercial marine fishing registry, permit, or license even feasible for Hawaii? So before setting out on their journey, Conservation International designed a unique approach. And that approach was to create a space for an uncommon conversation. And they wanted to uh, fill this space with people who are passionate about ensuring that future generations were able to fish and benefit from the fisheries. And they want to ensure that traditions for future generations um, were maintained. But they also want to bring together people to the table that had distinct perspectives and the ability, very important, to listen, um, but to disagree reasonably. So how is this unique? Well, very good question. So what typically happens is when you're given a quest, a mission, a goal, you have a leader. The leader sets the path. Once he has that path in mind, he gather, gathers his team of heroes. And the team participates. And some teams do well. Some teams do not do so well. But the constituents of that team, some of them overlap. Some of them have points that they agree upon. Some of them have points that they don't agree upon. And that kind of issue is usually never addressed. What's always kept in the mind, in the focus, is the mission and the goal. Um, and in some cases, you know, the process and the group moves forward with their mission and they accomplish it. But in a lot of cases, those relationships aren't improved and the common areas of interest aren't grown over time. In contrast, if you look at the overlapping areas of interest, the overlapping passions, and you use this as a starting point before even moving forward with a common goal, then it opens the door to a totally different approach. So a fellowship is formed. So instead of taking the typical approach, CI, a large international conservation organization, reached out to Western, the Western Pacific Fisheries Management Council. If you're, a fisher, if you're familiar with Westpac and CI, um, you're probably thinking, whoa, that's kind of interesting. Never seen that before. Um, and when I was with Noah, that's exactly the same reaction I had. It's like, huh, what are they doing together? It's not usually kind of the, the normal pair that you see. But it was genius, ingenious. Um, they brought together two groups that had very similar interests, but maybe different perspectives. And as that as those two heroes came together, they then reached out and formed their own fellowship. And it was CI, the kingdom of CI, were to reach out and to recruit heroes 
Some heroes would say, nah, I don't want to work with CI. I'd rather work with Westpac. And same thing, if the kingdom of Westpac went out and they tried to re recruit heroes, some of those heroes would be like, ah, you know, my kingdom's not really aligned with Westpac. Um, but as CI reached out with Westpac in partnership, people were like, huh, this is kind of interesting. I want to jump on board, at least participate for a little while and see what happens. So that's what happened. And together this fellowship formed and it was consisting of a whole bunch of different groups of heroes from throughout the kingdom. Uh, it consisted of subsistence fishers, cultural practitioners, shoreline fishers, boat fishers, spear fishers, pelagic fishers, marine conservationists, members from the state and federal government. So you have a whole bunch of kingdoms coming together and they're, they're representative heroes, representing their kingdoms and kind of huh, checking out this, this idea. So this, the benefits of this uncommon approach was immediately apparent. So for about a year or so, our heroes went on this journey together. The first and probably one of the most more challenging missions or quests was to come to an agreement on what the purpose of that group should be. Um, as you can imagine, uh, people that were participating were probably very passionate about what they wanted to see. Some wanted a license, some wanted a registry, some wanted a permit, some didn't want anything at all. Um, so it was very hard to come to an agreement about what everybody should be pursuing together. Uh, but when everything kind of was worked out, what was agreed upon was that the group, the group should, should um, go on a journey and research the, all the different options that existed with a registry, a permit, and a license, and agree upon a preferred option that maximize the benefits to the people, people of Hawaii and minimize any of those challenges. And what they based kind of that criteria on was would the RPL system um, improve data? Would it improve two-way dialogue between fishermen and government? And would it provide a funding source for effective management in the future? So our heroes set out on the quest. The first quest they came upon was in their own kingdom. So they looked in Hawaii and they explored a hunting license, a bottom fish license, a, com a commercial marine fishing license, and a recreational fish, uh, freshwater license. So it looks like it's apparently possible in Hawaii. So they journeyed off to far, far lands, far, far away. They interviewed other systems within the United States. And they also went beyond those borders to um, call the U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, Puerto Rico, a whole bunch of different other um, entities that were already either implementing a fishing license permit or registry or were thinking about it. So as they had these conversations, they learned. But what was most important is that they learned together. So instead of one entity going out and doing all this research as a group, as a hui, as a fellowship, they all learned together. So one guy couldn't say, ah, you know, he did the research, I don't believe him. Everybody was present and everybody was engaged in the learning process together. They even went out to consult the gods and the goddesses from the far off supernatural worlds. And these, these knowledge holders had very specific information. And in this case, it was Malia Akutagawa from the legal program. But it was also the government uh, people that were in charge of the DJ funds um, and very specific knowledgeable people to answer very specific questions that the group had. So we, with each quest, the group gathered more and more information. And as I mentioned, what's equally important is that that common area that started off pretty small, you know, everyone had an agreement upon they wanted to see better fisheries for Hawaii. That common area grew as, a, as the group did more research together. And what was more important is that as the common understanding and common respect grew, so did those relationships. All of a sudden, you had the participants working together more on other projects, not only on the license project. Ah, a report. So one pen to rule them all. In December of 2016, the group submitted their analysis for a DLNR to consider, and they shared this with the public. The report featured um, all kinds of in, uh, great information. And it was, it was highlighted in local news, in social media, in blogs, and it was posted on uh, multiple websites by the participants. 
It was a true wealth of knowledge that uncovered really a lot of nuggets of information, but more importantly, in its entirety, it was supported by all the participants of the group. So does that mean our heroes failed? Was there a preferred option? Anybody know? So there was not a preferred option. What had happened is originally the group had wanted that at the beginning of the process, but because the process was designed to be flexible and open and transparent, people didn't agree, which was great. Um, and at the end of that process, there was no agreement on a preferred option. So the report laid out all the different options for a registry, a permit, and a license, but the group did not con come to consensus on what the preferred option was. And looking back on that process, that conclusion is way more valuable than forcing a vote within the group, because that would have immediately broken apart the group, broken apart the fellowship. So is that the end? Is that the end of the story? Well, like any good story, this is a trilogy. And in the second part of the trilogy, it starts off really, really fast and really, really exciting. So that book closed and another one opened. Bam! A new quest. So the department now came back and asked our fellowship to go on a new quest. Earlier this year, the Division of Aquatic Resources formally asked our fellowship of heroes to once again spring into action. In the group, in the letter, pictured here, um, the department identified their preferred option. So they read the report, they read the analysis, and now the division has come forward with a preferred option. And they said, you know, we're gonna, we have intention to submit a bill in a 2019 legislative session. But in order for us to do so, we would like you, the Fellowship of Heroes, to take this information, this preferred option, and push it back out to the public. So reach far beyond all the countries and all the partnerships and all the fellowships that you know. Spread the information far and wide, ask questions and gather feedback and come back to us. Tell us what you hear, tell us what you learned. And with that information, we will move forward and that information will base, um, inform our decision making processes. So the book is midway. Um, start, starting earlier this week, um, the study group or the fellowship of heroes will be meeting pretty much three nights every week for the next two months um, holding over 25 meetings small group meetings larger group public meetings on every island in the state we are as a group reaching out to as many fishers as possible online in in person um, and in a large group setting so it's a massive undertaking and what's really um, kind of a really good example of the success of the approach is that no one entity within that fellowship would be able to do it alone. Um, because there's such a diverse group that makes up that, that uh, fellowship, we can play upon each other's strengths. Where CI can go and reach a certain community, Westpac can reach a different community. The Native Hawaiian grassroots organization can meet, reach a different community. The spear fishers, the pole fishers, the boat fishers, we can all, um, reach out and talk to with different fishermen that as individual organizations we could never do. So what happens at the book end of book two? You gotta check back in in the 2019 legislative session, I guess. But what's really, really kind of the question is what happens in the last book of the trilogy. Because you know in the last book of the trilogy, that's the big finale. It shows you it was all the book one and two. Was it worth it? Are our heroes going to reach that finale? Are they going to get the job done? Well, I guess we're going to have to kind of wait and see. Um, but until that time, I'd like to close. And the reason why this is presented in a story approach, as opposed to going down the individual process that was very specific to Hawaii, is that like any good story, you can switch out the characters, you can switch out the place, you can put in a different territory or a different jurisdiction and rename heroes. But what's really important is the core, it's the approach that was taken. Um, and that is the lesson that I hope to share with everyone today. Um, this project was po made possible by the Nor NOAA Coral Reef, Co Coral Reef Conservation Program, NOAA Fisheries, and a grant from the Har Harold Castle Foundation. Um, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions about the process in general or specifics about kind of where we're at with the Hawaii things. 
Um, but thank you for your time. Oh, right in the back. I can be super loud, I don't need this microphone, but thank you, great presentation, great storytelling. I have all these crazy images in my head of Kitty and Battle Gear. <laughs> um, but, so, Crystal Ball, if you had one, what do you think could happen in the third chapter of the, do you think Hawaii's gonna finally get a recreational license? Because I think Jersey was the last holdout and they've got theirs. <laughs> Whoa, no pressure there. Um, um, I, my guess as an individual, not CI, is that it will eventually happen. Um, I think the, the fishing community is gradually becoming more aware of management issues and they're gradually seeing a decline in resources. Um, but there's, the major hurdles still exist and that has to do with funding, it has to do with transparency and trust in government. Um, I think this process has moved uh, the initiative a lot farther forward than it's been in the past. Um, but no idea. No idea what's going to happen. Miranda's running between the chairs. Auntie. Hello, Mike. Oh, push the button on the bottom. Thank you. Is the battery dead? Doesn't he? You can hear me, right? I can hear you. Okay. I'll repeat your question. Hello, my um, Rocky Kaluhiva, um, Moko, um, Kola Poko, Ahapua, Heia. Our family's been in the Ahapua of Heia for over 200 years now. And our family is the Labaya family, yep. fishing family. And you talked about your, um, your kingdom, um, <laughs> your kingdom. <laughs> no one, no one has come to our, our area yet. Yep. And we are, actually we have the nearest project, one of 29 in the nation. We have the various, we have over six organizations combined into one for this nearest project. Never heard of that until now. Hmm? So you guys have been meeting in all this, all this time. No, no, no. You're getting all. No, so we start on Monday. Okay. Yeah. So you should get a Native Hawaiian practitioner. Absolutely. And when you have a Native Hawaiian professor who's not a Native Hawaiian practitioner, um, you should maybe get somebody from Ahamoku, maybe yep. Mana, but they should be at the table with your group. Because although the kingdom from all over the nation, remember <laughs> now, we are the only kingdom in the United States. Mahalo. Absolutely, and thank you for that. So um, I didn't get into specifics, but two of the members within the study group um, is Oha and Kua. And the way the outreach was divided, it was divided on Oahu into very specific groups, um, basically in gear type. So shoreline, spear, boat, charter, and native wine. So there's gonna be a group specifically um, looking for that feedback, and then there's gonna be the large public meetings. Um, we haven't reached out, and that's my fault because I'm in charge of the shoreline fishing one, and that's when I was gonna contact Hile. Good, because I, I, I belong, I go to the OHA meetings, I go to the Oha meetings and I, and I go to, I'm part of KUO, the NEO project. Yeah. But again, this is not Native Hawaiian practitioners and it should be reached out to them too. Um, totally agree. Yeah. I, I'll just add the form from the director of the environmental program. Nemana Damati is the governor's appointee for the Native Hawaiian practitioners. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to it's add just, just for clarification, um, Professor, as I understand it, Professor Malia Kudagawa is a, the Po'o, or the chief of the Aha Kiole Omolkai. She's been involved in the Ahamoku, uh, and, and she, she is, is a practitioner, but there are lots of different practitioners around, the, uh, around uh, Hawaii, so there are lots of different, different areas. But your, your point is, is well taken, yep. that, that there needs to be a much more outreach, and that's what I heard Matt talking about, that there is gonna be much more outreach. <coughs> Oh, right next to you. Yeah, have you noticed any collateral or concrete collateral benefits of the process that you went through involving everyone, aside from just the licensing or the registration, um, anything else that's come out of that that's been positive? Um, I mean, I, I get calls from the members asking for the other members' cell numbers because they want to work on projects together. Um, and just, just, you can see, if you're a fly on the wall on the first day of the project, 
when you first got together in that meeting, you can tell people were hesitant. I mean, they weren't bringing their A-team with them. They weren't putting everything on the table. But a year into the process, they, I mean, everything was on the table. Um, so the relationship was clearly improved. Um, I think another concrete example is after the report was published, two bills were introduced in the 2018 legislative session. Um, and what typically happens with the fishing bill, because it comes up every single year, is the bill it gets introduced and all kinds of crazy comments come out. Sky is falling, whatever. Um, and with this round, the comments were few and they were logical. And when you looked at what's happening, that was happening on social media, is guys would say, hey, this, this bill is coming out. And then they make some crazy remark. And then people would start chiming in. Hey, the study group looked into it. Here's the link, go to the report. It kept coming up over and over and over again. Um, is it the perfect option? I don't think so. Uh, but it was, in my personal opinion, it was clearly uh, a success. The process was helpful. Oh, I should add, there's, I don't want to point them out, but there's four participants in the room if they want to chime in. So four study, uh, study group members. I, I would just say that I was a member. That <laughs> <laughs> was great. Uh, and it really, it, it was a very honest question that was asked. And I think it was a very honest process built around answering the question of, is this feasible in Hawaii? And I think the particularly revelatory parts of the process were just being able to ask those questions that everybody always has. Could Native Hawaiians be exempt? Uh, could the funds be banked in a, in a place that wasn't the general funds? Could the funds be used for enforcement? Which was actually a pretty big deal question that needed a lot of answering. Um, so, to be able to lay bare those questions and then lay bare those answers in a public report, I think was really helpful. Uh, it's, there's certainly a long way to go, um, and I, don't, I, think, I think the power of the narrative was real helpful. I don't know if anyone would consider themselves heroes on it so much as just people who really were hoping to get across some of those perceived barriers between the interests of our respective organizations and really create some fertile ground for a good open and honest discussion. And I think in that way, that was a real collateral benefit that I think will, will rear its head in many ways moving forward. And so does everybody know Eric? So Eric Cole from the Harold K. Castle Foundation <laughs> and Fisherman. <coughs> Yeah, um, so I'm getting these, these whispers in my ear. So Erin Gross, she's with Conservation International. She was the, actually the lead for this project. So could you stand up? So if you have questions, you can go ask her. <laughs> so I'm also a graduate of Richardson and the Environmental Law Program. And um, I think one thing that was really interesting to me about this project was this was a really different way of approaching this really sensitive and difficult issue. Um, and the experiment kind of was, can we have a sustained conversation about this? A lot of times the issue is dropped like a bomb in the middle of a room where people have very different, very passionate, legitimate concerns um, about the topic. And people will lob things at each other and then walk out of the room and wait for the next public opportunity to talk about it. And um, I think the thing that was an interesting experiment for everybody in the room was to see if we could have a conversation that was sustained about these complicated, uh, complex, emotional, difficult, um, issues and then figure out some way to uh, share what we learned with other people in a way that everyone was comfortable with. So the first chapter of the book seemed impossible at the very beginning of this project. Um, and by the end of it, we were able to find a way to talk about these issues where people felt comfortable directing 
the people within their own networks that have their own particular perspective to that to the same report. Um, and that was huge. <laughs> that was huge to have everybody um, feel comfortable about what we found and what we shared and how we shared it, um, and to keep sharing it with other people, not necessarily to influence their opinions about the end result of the conversation, but to help it be a richer conversation while it was going on that wasn't so divisive and was a little bit more um, thoughtful collectively about something that's, it's a very challenging, very difficult topic and it continues to be. Um, but I think that our ability to have the same people in the room for over two years now, it's a small group of people, but that's how you build trust here. You can't just issue a flyer and have people show up and expect them to trust each other. It takes a really long time. So we've been trying to expand that circle of trust in a really deliberate way. Um, and for some people, it's too slow. Um, it, for some people, it's too small still. Um, and so we struggle with how do you keep the size to be one that supports trust among the individuals, but then also has a level of transparency that people who aren't in that circle of trust yet don't feel excluded. And it's very difficult. <laughs> we continue to um, we continue to try and be responsive to both of those things. So anyway, I'm happy to try and answer questions if people have them about the project. But. by saying I'm really impressed that Matt has time to read or watch Netflix or whatever <laughs> all those I'm like wow that's amazing what are those things you know those re literary references um, and I just want to and I'm sorry I forced you to stand up but I mean I really want to compliment CI and Castle and all the partners involved um, from the legal perspective often our reaction is oh we should pass a law or amend the law or whatever but <laughs> this is like a forced conversation and it's so interesting to watch Aaron and all the partners be involved in that and Aaron attends our law fellows meeting it's interesting for the law fellows to hear about this conversation that this how important process is not necessarily jumping to well we got to go in this session and do something so as you said a long tough conversation but thank you for making it what it truly is which is heroic and a great story that can be shared and with others so thank you Matt and Aaron and everyone. <laughs>